I would like to extend a large thank you to HelloFresh for sponsoring this week's podcast. If you're a fan of the show, you probably heard me talk about HelloFresh before. I just want to reiterate that these guys are legit and they really do make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. There's a reason they're America's number one meal kit. HelloFresh makes sure to deliver fresh, quality produce right from the farm to your door in less than a week. So you can savor summer flavors right from home. They also give you 30 dinner recipes to choose from every single week, which allows for an awesome amount of variety and customization. Just a couple nights ago, I whipped up a creamy mushroom alfredo that was honestly better than most restaurants that I've had pasta at. I can recommend HelloFresh enough, and I love the feeling of self-satisfaction for making my own meals as opposed to ordering them in. And on top of that, Green Chef is now owned by HelloFresh, and with a wider array of meal plans to choose from, there's something for everyone. I love switching between the brands and now my listeners can enjoy both brands at a discount with me. Make sure to go to HelloFresh.com slash MrCreep16 and use code MrCreep16 for up to 16 free meals and 3 free gifts. I'm currently 18 years old, finishing up my senior year of high school. Throughout grade school, many friends came and went, but only four are important for the story. I won't use the real names. There was Johnny, a 19-year-old who had yet to start college, said something about getting his stuff together before he went away, whatever that meant. He was never one to have his life all squared away nicely, if you get what I mean. Still a very nice guy, though. Would proudly jump in front of a bullet for any one of us. Julia, also 19 but already in college. She was visiting home for the summer. She was a bright, happy soul and her smile made the rest of us smile. Especially Johnny. I suspect that he had a slight crush on her. I wish he got the chance to tell her how he really felt. They would have made a good couple. And she could definitely have helped him with his troubles at home. Her brother Edmund, or Ed, was 16, and the youngest of us all. He would occasionally talk under his breath, and you would have to repeat yourself to get his attention. He loved the outdoors, but was a bit of a neat freak, always bringing hand sanitizer and bear spray with him whenever we went romping about in the woods, despite the fact that no bears had been seen in our town for over five years. Lastly, there was Teddy a high-wired, nerdy, 17-year-old with orange, curly hair, like Miss Frizzle from the Magic School Bus. He was tall and lanky, and back when creepypastas were a big thing on the internet, we convinced him to dress up as Slenderman for Halloween one year. Gotta admit, it was a pretty scary costume. He actually pranked us with it a couple of times while all those fake Slenderman sighting videos and short films were floating around and he had everyone convinced the thing was actually real. I remember vividly how he had snuck into my house one morning with the costume and stood at the foot of my bed until I woke up. I think I screamed so loud that the neighbors down the street even heard it. But Teddy's favorite interest was biology, specifically paleontology. He would always try to tell us about the coolest new prehistoric species or dinosaur that had been discovered recently. The others humored it, especially Ed, who seemed greatly interested in the subject as well. I never shared the enthusiasm, though. I don't know. Maybe it's just a me thing, but I didn't really want to hear about the brand new Super Ceratops or Ceratospinus, or whatever crazy names he would ramble on about. As I mentioned earlier, one of our favorite activities was running around the woods. We live in a fairly populated suburb of western North Carolina. Despite that... Our town bordered the Appalachian Mountain Range, and the town was surrounded by a massive expanses of forest and open prairie, some of it practically unexplored. There were some patches of land that were labeled a private property and no trespassers allowed, but nobody really knew who owned the land. Apparently it was a dangerous place, and the people who went there sometimes didn't return. A big urban legend about a creature called the Fleshgate 
an animalistic monster that could take the form of a man after consuming his remains. It was essentially our town's boogeyman, a tall tale used to scare kids into eating their vegetables and following their curfew, lest the monster snatch them up and turn them into child stew. I won't lie, it scared the bejesus out of me when I was that age, until I grew up and I researched it, learning it was basically a ripoff of the more well-known Native American skinwalker story. So of course, there was no monster. But the real reason for the private land and the unexplained disappearances remained a mystery. Well, one day, in the early morning sun of June, me and my little crew set out on another expedition into the woods. It was to be an exciting adventure. We would follow a small creek farther than we ever had before, mapping out whatever we found at its end. We would look for unique landmarks, good trees to climb into any site, Sounder's smell of wild animals. We had seen deer, fox, coyote, skunk, possum, and raccoon all in these surrounding woods. But we wanted to find something big, something extraordinary. A bear, a moose, a mountain lion, a wolf. We even teased about finding the legendary flesh gate, maybe tracking it to its lair and using rock clubs and spears to hunt the beast down and make the forest safe for all the children. We began our journey at dawn, for that was the best time to spot animals. It was right before the nighttime critters were ready to retire to their dens, and right when the other inhabitants of the forest were starting the day shift. The creek, which Johnny had given a cliché name, Creek of John, since he had discovered it, ran for a long while winding through the trees, past peaceful meadows, down rocky waterfalls. But where it ended, we did not know. That was what we had intended to find out today. And we followed the stream down its usual route, under the large oak trees that shaded us from the sun, past the peaceful meadows where the rabbits played and cuddled, and down the precarious waterfalls where the middles and frogs sat at the bottom, ready to gobble up any insects that fell in. And we went further and further. And we followed the stream for a good 45 minutes, and eventually we did find its end. The path up ahead was obscured by a small hill. No way the stream was making it over that. Johnny, Julia, and Edmund were thrilled. Teddy was happy but clearly exhausted. We had gone much further than initially anticipated. We rushed down to the bottom of the hill, but the sight that met us left us truly puzzled. The water trickled into a medium-sized pool, but it was not the only thing filling it. There was a pipe sticking out from the side of the hill. It looked like it had been deliberately placed there to empty water from an unknown source. What the heck is this? Julia asked. Maybe it's connected to the town's reservoir. Teddy pondered. I don't know, but that's some freaky looking stuff right there. Was all that Johnny could get out before Julia punched him in the arm. Ow, oh, what was that for? She gestured over to Edmund, and immediately Johnny understood. Edmund got really uncomfortable when people sweared, and we never knew exactly why. But Julia said her grandparents weren't exactly the kindest to him, and it only worsened what they learned of his conditions. I found it shocking that an elder could be mean like that, especially to a kid. Look, I'm sorry, all right, Johnny continued, raising his hand up defensively. But seriously, look at that. Tell me it doesn't look like something straight out of Cabin in the Woods. What? You think the flesh gate put it there? Asked Julia with a smug look on her face. Of course not, exclaimed Johnny. That's just a kid's story. Suddenly, as if on a horror movie cue, there was a rustling in the bushes to our left. We all looked over and tell him that Johnny looked genuinely frightened, like he was starting to doubt his previous statement. A bizarre growling sound emanated from the bush, and we could see that a quadrupedal figure slowly emerged. I sucked in my breath as I came face to face with a fox. We all sighed in relief as the curious canine eyed us. It turned and trotted away into the forest after a few moments of silent staring. We then resumed our confusion over the random pipe in the middle of the forest. Teddy had the idea to check if it was connected to anything. So we got down on our hands and knees and began digging. 
Sure enough, another pipe emerged from the side of the hill in a few minutes. Teddy put his ear to it and listened. We sat there in anticipation, waiting for him to describe what he was hearing. It was not what we had expected. This isn't empty in water, he said. It's carrying water somewhere else. What? I said. It's not possible. It's empty and right over there, look. I pointed to the small pool and the draining pipe. No, that's got to be a different pipe then, Teddy said. This one's connected to somewhere else. I was about to retort when Ed had interrupted me, speaking for the first time since we had found the pipe. You guys, he said, you see that up there? He was pointing at the top of the hill. When we all looked, we saw nearly all the trees had private property signs. One even had a warning label, like going further was dangerous. Dang, I said. How did we not see that before? Though I already knew the answer. Ed had a knack for noticing things before everyone else, even as a little boy. I guess he's very attentive to his surroundings. You guys, I think we should turn back, Johnny suddenly said. I really don't think we should be going and sticking our noses where they don't belong, especially if this place belongs to someone else. Are you kidding? Julia suddenly yelled. This is the chance of a lifetime. We finally have a real mystery to solve. Yeah, easy for you to say. You've never been in trouble with the law before. What's that supposed to mean? Are you hiding stuff from us? Oh, what? No. It was just one speeding ticket. Hey, both of you, cool it, Teddy yelled. You're acting like a bunch of crazies. And Teddy's right, I added. We aren't going to get anywhere arguing like this. We should probably leave. I agreed with Johnny. If this place is private property, I really don't want to get us all dragged into a legal mess. Especially since my folks are. I was cut off by a scream. Not a human scream, but a fox's a distressed yelp. It sounded like something was attacking it. The sound suddenly drew closer, turning into frantic alarm barks. I had heard this sound only once before. When a fox, being chased by a coyote, ran into my backyard and hid under my dad's shed. The fox in that scenario got away, but this one seemed in a much worse predicament. We all looked to the top of the hill and saw the same fox from earlier running down it. It had a bloody wound on its side, and it was moving as fast as it could. It ran down the hill, past the pool that we were standing next to and into a small field of tall sedge grass. That's when we first saw it. One of them. A dark shadow suddenly appeared in the field. It was the size of a Labrador, and from its outline seemed to walk on two legs, but with the straightforward posture of a bird. It also had a long tail with some kind of fluff hanging off the end of it. It ran after the fox faster than any animal I had ever seen yet its movements were almost completely silent. It was as if this thing had an aura of quietness around it. It suddenly leaped into the air and came down upon the fox. A brief struggle ensued as the two creatures tumbled through the field and out of view. A small cloud of dust arose, and we could hear the fox desperately screaming. It was clearly caught in the predator's talons and fighting for its life. The screams were suddenly cut off though, and we heard a sharp yet silent snap, the sound of the fox's neck being broken. It was over in a heartbeat, and silence once again filled the field, as if the shadowy creature had never been there in the first place. Yet it still was. We could hear its faint panting as it caught its breath. My mouth hung open as my mind tried to process what the heck I just saw. It didn't seem real, and yet it very much was. I looked over to my friends to see an equally shocked expression on each of their faces. Teddy, the one who had an answer to everything via math and science, looked purely and utterly dumbfounded. Ed looked like he was doubting his own eyes, much like me. Julia actually gagged a few times and looked like she was going to hurl. She never was a fan of seeing animals do that whole circle of life stuff. 
Not on TV and definitely not in person. Poor Johnny looked like he was scarred for life though. His lips were trembling and his eyes watered like he was on the verge of tears. He was the first to speak and he said the one thing nobody wanted him to say in that moment. <laughs> Fleshgate. And that made my heart drop. And I'm sure that it did the others. I didn't think for certain that it actually was the Fleshgate. But just the thought made me shiver. I could already see Julia and Ed taking a few nervous steps back. Ed spoke up next in a hushed, scared voice. Uh, let's, let's just leave, guys. I was going to say something likely, and I agree, before booking it the heck out of there and never returning. But then Teddy did something that caught all of us off guard. He ran up the hill right toward the sedge field. Johnny tried to grab a hold of him, but he missed. Julia shouted out a desperate, Teddy, you wait! And poor Ed looked like he was going to pass out. We tore up the hill after him. But the kid must have been real motivated because he had outpaced all of us. Even Julia, the gold medal track runner. He made it over the crest of the hill and out of sight. All the while we shouted his name. Horrible images ran through my mind. The flesh gate waiting for us at the top of the hill. Assuming the form of Teddy after disemboweling him. Or maybe an FBI truck with loads of armed men, ready to take us down for exposing their hidden alien experiments. What we found though was Teddy standing motionless, staring off at the bottom of the hill. Johnny caught up with him first. I swear for that I ought to kick your... But he stopped, his own gaze following Teddy's. Me, Julia, and Ed caught up to them next. What are you two looking at? But my words once again left me at the sight of something that I'll never forget for as long as I live. At the edge of the grassy clearing stood a strange animal. It was hunched over the fox, stripping a long piece of meat from the body. It wasn't a violent display, but a delicate and refined one, like an eagle eating a fish. It used its rather long arms to help it scoop up the food and I could see at least three fingers tipped with small claws. The animal was indeed bipedal, but its legs were anything but human-like. Its knees were high up and so were the ankles. I couldn't see the feet at first. What I did see, though, was how long the thing was. It had a massive tail that had extended behind it, stiff and unmoving like a board. Altogether, it must have been at least nine feet long. The most peculiar thing about this animal, though, was the fact that it was covered, practically head to toe, in feathers. Its entire upper body had dark feathers, ranging in shade from black to gray to brown. The tail and arms both had longer feathers extending from them, looking like fancy wings. The underside had much lighter feathers, and they were also a bit shorter. It looked to be a bit yellowish on the belly. Its head was partially obscured by a bush, so I couldn't fully see its face, but it seemed to also be feathered, at least partially. I had never even heard of a creature like this before. What on earth was it? The flesh gate? Not a chance. This thing was much too elegant to be the awful, disfigured monster described in campfire tales. Some kind of undiscovered exotic bird. Maybe the truly bizarre plumage would make sense in that case. But what's an exotic bird doing in North Carolina? And Teddy had the answer before all of us, though. Only problem was that he was stupid enough to say it out loud when we were in earshot of it. No effing way, and that's a... Uh... Julia slapped a hand over his mouth, but it was already too late. The creature immediately stopped eating, its head slightly perking up. I heard a strange chirping and a hooting noise, like a bird or an owl but deeper in pitch. And then, in a surprisingly fast motion, the animal shot out of the brush and now stood only ten feet from us. It didn't attack, just stared at us with apparent curiosity. With its body full in view, I noticed details that I had missed before. Firstly, its face. The face resembled an eagle or a hawk. But instead of a beak, there was a long, scaly snout like a Komodo dragon. The eyes were orange with big pupils, also like a bird. 
It looked at us inquisitively with those eyes, and I felt like I saw intelligence in them. It was kind of scary, but its face made it look kind of cute. That's the best way that I can describe it at least. The only thing not very cute was the blood dripping from its lips and finger claws. It also had two orange streaks above its eyes, looking almost like fiery eyebrows. Now I could finally see its feet. They looked almost exactly like hawk's talons, but one claw, the front one, was much bigger than the others. I mean, they were huge. It reminded me of the claws of the... Wait, you gotta be kidding me. The realization hit me like a brick and I could only stare in complete awe and utter confusion as Julia whispered to Tad, What did you say this thing was again? He whispered, his voice shaking, It's a dinosaur. I finished his sentence for him. A dinosaur. We were looking at a freaking dinosaur. It was impossible. It made no sense at all. And yet it was standing right in front of us. A living, breathing dinosaur. An actual one. Edmund actually fainted. And Johnny and Julia looked not far behind. What? uttered Johnny. There's no way that's impossible. It's gotta be an overgrown peacock or something. I have no idea how, replied Teddy. But there's no mistaking that body shape or those claws. I could tell that his shock was wearing off, quickly being replaced by nerdy excitement. I mean, that's the one defining trait of it. Ah, Teddy, cut the bull, suddenly interrupted Julia. That's not a dinosaur, it's a big bird. Since when do dinosaurs have feathers? Haven't you watched any movies? They're just big lizards. Stop trying to freak us out and tell us what this actually is. She was fuming looking almost ready to chew Teddy's head right off. I was honestly more scared of her in that moment than the creature cautiously eyeing us mere feet away. And Teddy wasn't intimidated, which is funny in retrospect, as he's probably the most cowardly of us all. That's because your childhood lied to you, he said matter-of-factly. And then without another word, he whipped out his phone and typed something faster than I could imagine possible. Within practically the blink of an eye, he was showing both of us an image. This is what a raptor actually looks like, not those scaly movie monsters from Jurassic Park. The image showed a large feathered animal with a scaly muzzle. It was practically identical to the creature in front of us, except the colors were different. He scrolled down, showing more and more pictures. They all lined up. And they all had the name under them. Julia knew that she was defeated, but still she couldn't believe it. I could hardly believe it myself, and I wouldn't call myself a massive skeptic unlike Julia. But uh, how, why, it doesn't make sense. Tell us something we don't know, I said with a sarcastic tone. Apparently she took offense to that. She looked over at me angrily and was about to say something else when a low chirp made his turn. Guess we had somehow forgotten about the dinosaur a coin toss away. The animal had begun approaching us, its head tilting almost like a dog's. It kept its curious yet cautious attitude as it took one delicate step towards us at a time. It approached Johnny first. We all held our breath as it slowly walked up to him, sniffed at his shirt, and poked his hand with its snout. I had never seen a man look so ready to crap his pants as Johnny did for those few seconds of contact. He looked white as a ghost, as if all the blood had just vanished from the blood vessels in his face. But the dinosaur didn't attack. Instead, it lowered its gaze and began sneaking towards something else. It was heading for Ad, still fainted in the grass, and Julia began looking around for something to protect her brother. She reached down, grabbed a stick, and was about to raise it over her head, and charged like a caveman attacking a saber-toothed tiger, but was stopped by Teddy. What the heck are you doing? She hissed through clenched teeth. Attacking him might just piss it off, and besides, Ed's actually in a perfect position. 
Animals generally won't attack something if they think it's dead. He whisper yelled back at her. That was true, actually. I remember reading in a book that the best way to survive a grizzly bear attack was to play dead. But how did he know if that trick would work on a raptor? The animal was now standing over Ed's at limp body. Ned lowered its snout to sniff at his shirt, and then his hands, just like it had done with Johnny. And then he began sniffing Ed's face. That's when Ed woke up, and he screamed. The scream was so loud and guttural, I actually had to cover my ears for a brief second. I turned away, fully expecting the next sound to be Ed getting disemboweled. But that sound never came, and I quickly looked back over to see the creature had jumped off Tad, apparently frightened by the noise. It then did something weird. It fanned out its wing feathers and began shaking them while hissing. Its mouth opened to reveal the row of small yet very sharp looking teeth, caked with fox blood. No way, a threat display. Teddy yelled with apparent happiness. Amazing. I knew this behavior was found in modern day owls and other birds of prey, but he didn't finish his sentence. As the dinosaur suddenly turned and ran away from us, it darted into the bush, paused a moment to grab the fox's body in its jaws, and then moved like a cheetah right into the thicket of brush and brambles. It was gone just like that. Julia helped Edmund up and he seemed thankful to be alive after that encounter. It didn't get any of me, did it? Nope, said Julia with a slight giggle. I do believe you're fully intact. All limbs and digits accounted for her. My mind was still racing from the pure and utter impossibility of it all. But I quickly realized what we needed to do. Come on guys, let's go home. Everyone turned to me with either confused or annoyed looks. And what exactly are we going home for? Said Teddy we just made the scientific find of the century. We have to follow it, see if there are any more of it. And of course we have to take pictures, or else who's going to believe us? Now I'll tell y'all something. This is going to make us all richer then. No, forget it, dude. I snapped at him. What does it matter? Obviously something shady is going on around here. What do you think those signs are up there for? I gestured to the trees. And what of those people who went missing after poking around the trespassing zone? What, you think they got eaten? Yeah, that or they were taken away by the government. Because they saw something they weren't supposed to see. Face it, Teddy, we're not meant for this. Whatever secrets are out here aren't for us to find. And trying to find it would probably get us all killed. Let's just go back home and swear to never speak of this day. They were silent for a minute after my speech until Ed had walked to my side. I agree with them. I mean, there's probably nothing but trouble out there. Something terrible could happen to us. Teddy looked like he wanted to say something, anything. But he knew that his argument was finished. I guess that settles it then. Alright, let's go. You can shove that quitter attitude right up your hairy bomb, said Johnny suddenly. Did you just not see the most amazing stuff of your life? Something that you'll remember on your deathbed? Well, I know I did. And there's no way I'm going to let curiosity eat away at me until the bitter end. I don't know about any of you, but I gotta know what's going on there, even if I get locked up again. What do you mean again? I started before Julia interjected. Can't believe I'm actually saying this, but I agree with Johnny her cheerful attitude had returned, and apparently the skeptic side no longer existed. This is what we were searching for, right? Something big, something scary, something that nobody's ever seen. And who on earth besides Sam Neill and Chris Pratt can say they've seen a living, breathing rapture up close? We gotta solve this mystery. They gathered on one side of the field, while me and Ed stood on another three on two and we were outnumbered. I weighed my options and then finally realized what I had to do. With a heavy sigh, I admitted defeat. All right, all right, we'll do this, but we got to make sure to stick together. And if anything, I mean anything bad happens, 
We run away and never look back. Got it? Got it. The three newfound dino hunters shouted in sync. You're really doing this? I mean, what if there's more of them out there? Said in an exasperated Edmund. I'm sure there's something out there. Not too fond of seeing it, but I can't let them go by themselves. If I left them here, they may never come back. And I'd blame myself for the rest of my life. Ed mumbled something that I couldn't hear. What? Ed, speak up. I suppose that's true. I was saying, I mean, I can't bring myself to leave Julia out here. Now you get how I feel, I replied, and then took a deep breath. Well, let's get going before the second thoughts kick in. All right, so we can't follow the dinosaur because the path it took is blocked by thorns, explained Teddy. However, we could go back to the pipe and see where that leads. So we tracked back down the hill to the area that we had dug up the pipe. Teddy listened again to determine which way the water was flowing. Then he pointed us in that direction. It led up the hill past the no trespassing signs. I knew this was the point of no return. We hiked through the wilderness, past trees and grasses and rolling hills, with no evidence that we were in some kind of top secret area. Eventually, a clearing became visible to us in the distance. As we got closer, we could hear the sounds of water below us. The pipe was running right toward that clearing. We picked up the pace, thinking that we were onto something. And oh boy, were we. We emerged into the clearing and were greeted by a large building, about three stories high. However, it wasn't actually a building but instead a 35 foot tall cage. Julia finished my train of thought for me. The cage was shaped like a dome and we can see the inside. It looked to be the habitat for some sort of animal with trees and a tall rock spire that looked artificial. We could see a river running through it, but the river had no apparent entry or exit point. It just kind of appeared into the cage. Look, the pipe, Johnny suddenly pointed. Sure enough, the pipe was attached to the side of the cage, emptying water to fill up the stream. So it was an animal habitat, but there was still one unanswered question, and it was easily the most important. What do you suppose lives in there? I asked. The raptor? Well, maybe, answered Teddy. It doesn't really look like a habitat for a terrestrial animal, though. More like a Hawkeye. An unfamiliar voice made us all jump practically out of our skin. I looked to our right and at the edge of the cage I could see two people approaching. One was a man and the other was a young woman. Considering the voice that we heard was female, I assumed it was her who had shouted. The man screamed next. Hawkeye, come on girl. They were headed right for us. We had to act quick before they noticed us. And that's when Johnny started running towards the cage. I was going to object, but those two people were practically on top of us and we had nowhere else to hide. We lugged it for the side of the cage and then carefully helped one another squeeze through the bars. We ducked down as low as the people finally reached the spot that we were previously standing at and listened as they began talking. Man, this is taking forever, the man said while panting. If we don't find that stupid bird soon, the boss is going to have our heads. Oh, calm down, Elliot, said the woman. I know Hawkeye like the back of my hand. She wouldn't have gone far. Well, if you know that much, maybe you'd figure out that they can climb trees, said a clearly annoyed Elliot, and use that to escape their pen. Well, I'm sorry, all right. Maybe I don't know everything about Deinonychus, but that's why this place exists, isn't it? Deinonychus... I whispered under my breath. You don't suppose this Hawkeye is the one we saw? Asked Teddy. Before I could reply, Elliot spoke up again. Alright, you go look that way. I'll head back to the trail. He gestured in the direction that we had come from. No matter what, we can't let that thing make it to town. If the world knew what we were doing here. Oh Jesus, stop overreacting, said the woman. We've dealt with far worse incidents than this. Yeah, I guess that's true, stammered out Elliot. Alright, let's get moving in quick. 
He ran back around the cage and the woman began running back the way we came, yelling Hawkeye's name. We heard the sound of an engine of some sort being started from behind us, but a small building attached to the side of the cage blocked our view. We heard something driving off. I sat back inside out of relief and stress. That was way too close. And who were those two people? Workers and government officials. The mystery of this place was only deepening. Man, that was a close shave there, huh? I joked with the group. Silence. Uh, guys, I said looking over. They were all looking up, their faces filled with awe. I heard Johnny utter, My God, under his breath. What are y'all looking at? I looked up. Wings, big ones. Dozens of pairs of massive wings were sweeping all around us in the cage. I had to do a double take before I could finally comprehend what I was seeing. And when I realized it, I shouted it out. Pterosaurs! There were a ton of them, diving down and swooping back up. There were big ones with long beaks and massive, colorful crests adorning their heads. And smaller ones with shorter, sharper wings and toothy snouts in place of beaks. They were all covered in some sort of furry material. Not exactly feathers, but not exactly hair either. Of course, Teddy knew each one. Pterodon, Ramphorhynchus, that's a Dimorphodon, and a Pterodactyl in no way, a Geosternbergia. He routed with glee as a truly giant flyer with the biggest and most vibrant crest in the whole flock passed by us. It must have had a 15 foot wingspan at the minimum. I found myself impressed that such a massive thing could even fly at all. They're so beautiful. I looked over to see Ed actually had tears in his eyes while watching the magnificent display above us. A sudden whoosh of wind came from our left. I looked over to see one of the airborne reptiles had landed on a small ledge next to us. Teddy, which one is that? I asked excitedly. A pteranodon longiceps. You can tell by the tall crest. He was right about that. A tall horn-like structure jutted off from the top of its noggin and it pointed skyward. It was brilliantly colored with shades of pink lined with black stripes, contrasting the rest of its body, which was white with a few black markings, with a black beak that had an orange spot on either side where the nostrils were. The eyes were small and beady yet shone a brilliant ice blue. Julia stood close to the pterosaur and that seemingly gave her an idea. She began carefully navigating across the rocks that we stood on to get a closer look. Sis, wait, exclaimed Dad. I wouldn't do that if I were you, added Teddy. We have no idea how these animals view people. They could get hostile. Yeah, Julia, that seems like a bad idea, I said. She looked over at us and smiled. I think she knew that it would help calm us down. Oh, relax, boys. I didn't win a gold medal on track for nothing. She said before continuing on, I wanted to ask her what track had to do with befriending a prehistoric reptile, but it was too late. She now stood right beside the creature. It looked at her yet and made no sound, a sound from the light clacking of its beak as it breathed. She got as close as she could, and then extended hand toward its face. I held my breath, fully expecting a little stunt to go terribly wrong, but to my surprise, the pterosaur didn't freak out or attack. Instead, it actually nuzzled her hand with its face like it was enjoying the attention. She laughed and called it cute, and soon that got all of us laughing. It was a nice, happy scene for a few seconds. You could take a photo of it and it would look like something out of Jurassic World. You know, before the whole park went to crap. But that was when disaster struck. As Julia turned to head back towards us, she slipped on a loose rock and came dangerously close to falling. She yelped in surprise and stuck out her hands to find anything to grab onto. Unfortunately, the only thing within arm's reach was the pteranodon's beak. She grabbed it and nearly pulled the animal down with her. However, it quickly regained its footing and began struggling against her grasp. Ed and Johnny ran over and took her by her other hand, pulling her out of harm's way. She let go of the beak, but clearly, the animal was spooked and agitated. 
It spread its huge wings and took to the sky. It began to shriek loudly, a sound almost as ear-piercingly unpleasant as a fork being dragged over a plate. And we covered our ears, but it quickly got much worse. Another pterosaur shrieked and then another. Soon, the entire flock was screaming. They all took to the skies and flew in a flurry around us. It was like a tornado come to life. They began dive-bombing us, pecking at our arms and legs and kicking us with their talons. We got knocked down many times, and Ed had a nasty cut in his arm from the bite of a pterodactylus. Oh, we gotta get out of here now, Johnny shouted. We fought our way through the enraged flock to the other end of the cage. We had to squeeze through the bars one at a time, all the while getting packed, kicked, and clawed. I had just made it through and Teddy was the last to get out. We turned to run for it when he suddenly screamed. I turned around and my stomach sank as I saw the massive Geo Sternbergia had a grip on his leg and it wasn't letting go. I was frantically flapping and trying to lift him off the ground. Teddy had one arm wrapped around a cage bar hanging on for dear life. Help me, he screamed desperately to us. We ran back and grabbed him, fighting to hold him down. The flying beast had impressive strength though, and we had to pull with all of our might to keep it from carrying him off. It was biting into his leg with its beak, and I suddenly remembered Julia's mishap that started this mess. It gave me an idea. I reached through the bars and grabbed the beak and then pulled with all my might. I pulled and pulled and I pulled and it felt like I was towing a 16-wheeler by hand. Eventually though, the giant pterosaur had enough and let go of Teddy's leg. I released the beak and was immediately forced backwards. The great flyer shook its head in disorientation, and then turned and flapped its way back up to the circling flock. After a minute, the screeching and the frantic flapping slowed as the pterosaurs regained their calm. We yanked Teddy through the bars with such strength that I was worried we had dislocated his shoulders at first. However, it turned out that he was moaning because of the bleeding wound on his leg instead. Ed thankfully had brought a first aid kit and as he did on all our hikes as a just in case. We patched up Teddy's leg and Ed's arm and then waited until he was strong enough to stand back up. I flippin' told you not to do that, he said to Julia while punching her arm. Oh come on, the poor things just got scared. It was kind of your fault though, said Ed, not afraid to call out his own sister. Well okay okay, I'm sorry. I didn't want anybody to get hurt. Nobody's saying that, Julia. It was an accident, we all know that, said Johnny, apparently playing the good cop now, if only for Julia. Hey, thanks, Johnny. At least somebody here takes my side. And Julia was given the stink I'd add as she said this, apparently feeling the biggest betrayal was her own flesh and blood. Ah, uh, well, yeah, it was nothing, don't worry about it. I thought that I saw a hint of a blush on Johnny's cheeks there. His stutter got a laugh out of Julia, which helped raise our spirits after the harrowing experience. Suddenly, Ed's voice floated to us from a distance. Yo guys, you gotta come see this. We all turned and saw that he was waving us over while standing in front of that smaller building I had mentioned earlier. We looked at each other and then decided to go check it out. We rounded the corner and he pointed to a large open garage door. The inside of the building was a little dark but we could make out some basic things inside. Benches, desks, a large pinboard on the wall and a couple buckets. We went in to take a closer look and immediately picked up on a foul stench. It was like dead fish. It didn't take long to find out what was causing it. Ew, that's disgusting, Julia said after looking in one of the buckets. We looked inside too and were greeted with a bucket full of dead anchovies. The smell was so bad I felt hot bile rising up in my throat. I turned away to vomit. But it did that. Almost puke but you can't quite force it out so you gotta swallow it again thing. That everybody hates. Johnny gagged loudly before announcing. Why do they got that nasty stuff? Isn't it obvious? Teddy answered. It's food for the pterosaurs. He was looking through a door that apparently led to the interior of the cage, with several empty buckets lying at the side. 
Huh, so these guys like seafood? I questioned. Well, of course, he said. Every species in there is a fish eater. In the wild, they would be found on shorelines and rocky beach cliffs, like modern seabirds. So are pterosaurs basically prehistoric seagulls? Asked Ed, and then added while looking at his arm. They certainly have the same temper. Jackpot! Johnny's voice suddenly boomed. We looked over and found him dancing around a large tarp. Actually, something large was covered by a tarp. I immediately recognized the outline. He lifted the tarp to reveal the car, specifically a 1993 model Jeep. I only knew this because I went through a car phase when I turned 16 and obsessively researched every brand and almost every model. What are you planning on doing with that? Julia asked. Well, when we're solving the mystery of the de instinct dinosaurs, do you really want to have to walk everywhere? He said. The next big clue could be a mile away for all we know. These woods are practically endless. Ah, uh, no, I'm not getting arrested for Grand Theft Auto, swiftly retorted Julia. You do realize that we've already likely broken several laws just being here, right? Teddy chimed in. And besides, my leg isn't fully well yet. It'll be a pain in the butt to go the long way. Realizing that you lost this argument, Julia sighed. If we get caught, I'm leaving the both of you behind. That had Johnny and Teddy looking legit worried for a second, but they shrugged it off quick with some fake laughter. Johnny got to work hot wiring the car, and then we all piled in and flew out of the garage. We drove in a straight line for a while, through what looked like an old dirt road before we came to a turn. There were two signs before us. Large carnivores, straight. Medium herbivores, left. We looked at each other. The choice was so obvious that no words were said. A few nods were sufficient. The mystery would hopefully be solved soon enough. We turned left. The car buckled a little as we went down the old dirt road, heading deeper into the forest. As Johnny drove us towards the medium herbivore area, I took to investigating the car that we were in. I found lots of gear lying around, stuff like flashlights, flares, first aid kits, and even a rifle. I then noticed a small flyer sticking out of the glove compartment. I took it out and I looked at the cover. It had a picture of a dinosaur that looked kind of like a T-Rex but with longer arms. I showed it to Teddy and asked what it was. That's an Allosaurus frigilis. You can tell by the three fingers and the head crest. As usual, he was right, as it had bright red crests shaped like small horns just above its eyes. The body was a light tan, like a lion or a cougar, and the belly was white. Its eyes were light green. I wondered if they had one of these in the large carnivore area. If they did, I certainly didn't want to run into it. The next thing that caught my eye was the logo on the top of the page. I-P-E-S. Hmm, what's that stand for? I asked after reading the initials aloud. I think it says it underneath, commented Ed. I looked closer and saw a small row of words that indeed matched the initials above them. International Preserve for Extinct Species. So that's the place, huh? I would have expected a more flashy name, said Johnny at the wheel. Hold on now, this place is international. This changes everything. Who knows how many countries there might be working on this, exclaimed Julia. But why? Why do world powers want with a bunch of extinct reptiles? I questioned. Are you kidding me, dude? Asked Teddy. What wouldn't they want with them? Food, uh, pharmaceuticals, testing subjects. Heck, they might even be training these puppies for World War III. War? You can't be serious, dude. Snorted Johnny. Well, maybe not, but still, there's got to be some sort of demand for these animals. Or else they would most likely still be extinct. Maybe they're studying their behavior into physical attributes. Maybe this is the next phase of paleontology. I don't know. What if the black market's involved? I asked. You know, that deep web, selling human organs kind of stuff. I'm sure something like the liver of a brontosaurus would fetch a big price. 
Oh, that's terrible, said Julia. How could they do that to an innocent creature? The same innocent creature that nearly tore Teddy's leg off, said Johnny with a laugh. Julia looked angry and was about to respond when Teddy answered my question from before. I'm not sure that's it. These animals seem well looked after and the place seems pretty professional. I don't think those dark web guys would be too concerned with the welfare considering they kidnapped an auction off living people. I pondered his response for a moment and then said, Yeah, that's a good point. Oh well, I guess we'll just have to wait and see. The car abruptly skidded to a halt, nearly throwing me in at the front windshield. Uh, what the heck, Johnny? I exclaimed. Look, there. He was pointing in front of the car. I looked and saw three small dinosaurs running down the dirt road. They ran on two legs like the Deinonychus did, but they lacked the big claw and the long muzzle. Instead, they had short, parrot-like beaks and smaller hands and feet. They were feathered but not entirely. A row of bristly quills ran down their backs. They were green in color as was the rest of the body with white stripes running up and down like a zebra. Teddy, what are those? Dryosaurus, he shouted. They're small herbivores from the Jurassic. The dinos ran down the road and then up a small grassy hill. We quickly followed them in the car. When we had reached the hill, we got out of the car and began walking up it. But we suddenly stopped when we heard a sound that was strange from the top of the hill. Some sort of deep-pitched moaning or a grunting sound. It sounded like a large creature and it didn't sound alone. Johnny motioned for us to stay at the bottom of the hill and then slowly clambered to the top on all fours to stay stealthy. Slowly, he peeked his head over the crest of the hill and suddenly ducked down like he was startled, but he quickly looked up again. He then motioned for Teddy to join him at the top. Teddy scrambled up the side of the hill and when he looked over the crest, I heard him mutter, Holy crap, under his breath. Soon, the other three of us had joined them. When I looked over the hill, I was greeted with a massive open field. Green grass ran in a downward slope to our right, and a small stream trickled out of the woods to our left. But that's not what caught my attention at first. What did was the dozens of giant dinosaurs lumbering across the field. It was a massive group of what appeared to be herbivores. There were three species, the Dryosaurus from earlier, now in a much larger flock. A horned dinosaur with black skin and a light brown underbelly, and a strange beast with a small head, large plates along its back, and four lethal looking spikes on the tail. For once, I didn't need Teddy to identify it. Wow, that's a, a stegosaurus, right? It was my favorite as a kid. Yep, possibly the most well-protected herbivore to ever exist, Teddy finished. No kidding, those spikes look mean as heck, commented Ed. And what's the other one, a triceratops? Julia asked while looking at the horned dinos. Uh, close, but no. Those are nasuteratops, you can tell by the round frill and the bowl-like horns. Indeed, the horns of the animal were shaped like that of a Spanish fighting bull, but the animal itself was much bigger, about the size of a bison. An interesting thing to note is the males and females looked different. Females were smaller and had dull colored frills. Males were large and not only had a frill and face colored bright yellow, but their backsides and tails had bristly quills like a porcupine. It was definitely one of the weirdest looking dinosaurs that I had ever heard of. I could tell which gender was which as the large males with bright faces were facing off with each other. One of the biggest bulls, distinguished by having part of his left horn broken off, was sparring with a smaller male. They locked horns like how rutting deer or rhinos do, pushing back and forth and kicking up dust as they went. The commotion made the other grazing herbivores begin to move away. I began to worry that we should get back as well. And then, with one big push, the broken torn bull forced his rival onto the ground, where it broke off from him before struggling to its feet. That seemed to end the fight, as the rival bull began to back away while a broken horn pawed the ground and bellowed deeply. Dang, that was sick, 
said Johnny a little bit too loudly. The massive animal lifted his head after hearing his voice. He sniffed the air a couple of times and then turned to face us. By now, we had all stood up to get a better view of the fight, stupidly putting us in full view. Broken Horn regarded us with a small, beady eyes. Okay, guys, whispered Teddy. The best thing to do here is slowly back away and don't look him in the eye. Wait, I heard about this, said Johnny. I watched a Nat Geo documentary about blackbirds, and they said that they're actually big cowards. They'll only fake charge you and won't attack if they see you as too threatening. How's a black bear compare? Stand back, my friend, and let the muscle of the group handle this. He winked at the rest of us before turning to the herd. Johnny, don't, shouted Teddy, but it was already too late. Johnny spread out his arms and started running right toward the herd. He shouted as loud as he could while sprinting at the massive reptiles. Julia screamed and Ed looked away. And I almost puked as I knew he was about to get his dumb butt killed right in front of us. But surprisingly, the herd seemed to spooked by his bizarre display. The dryosaurs fled and the stegosaurs grunted and formed a small huddle, with their heads in the center and spiky tails sticking out as a defense. The Nesuteratops began backing away while bellowing, and a few spooked and ran. The old bull took one step back, keeping his head lowered and eyes on Johnny. He didn't make a single sound. Johnny jumped in the air and shouted happily when he saw his reckless plan had worked, before turning back to us and shouting, See, I told you that I was. His biggest mistake of all was turning his back. The moment that he turned, Broken Horn saw his chance and barreled forward, much faster than you would think an animal that size can move. He lowered his horns as he came, clearly ready to impale Johnny. We shouted to him, told him to run or turn around or duck, but it was too late. By the time that he had turned his head, the bull's intact horn hooked him on the side. Thankfully, it didn't actually strike his body, but it caught onto his coat and pulled him along for the ride. The bull paused for a moment and then with one motion threw its head skyward, sending Johnny flying through the air like he was shot out of a cannon. He must have made it 25 feet off the ground and had at least three solid seconds of airtime. He screamed and flailed as gravity pulled him back down, and a resounding thud echoed across the field as flesh met dirt. There was also a slight cracking sound, which Johnny later informed us was one of his ribs. He laid there motionless for a second, and then with a muffled growl, slowly began pulling himself off the ground. Big mistake. He was right in front of Broken Horn, who snorted and lowered his head to charge again. We shouted once again, both at Johnny to get out of the way and at the dinosaur in the hopes of scaring it off. Teddy and Edmund even began picking up rocks and twigs and throwing them at the animal, which drew its attention towards us. This momentary distraction helped Johnny begin to crawl away, but I realized that we would now be on the receiving end of those horns. And then the strangest thing happened. The whole forest around us suddenly went quiet. All the birds and frogs that we were hearing just a second ago had stopped instantly. The dinosaurs also changed. Almost in unison, the herbivores lifted their heads, sniffing the air and seemingly growing restless. Broken Horn turned his gaze to our left, down at the stream by the tree line. It seems that he could see something we couldn't. A loud snap of a twig in that area made us jump. It spooked the herbivores too. The Dryosaurus began making some sort of alarm call, a weird high-pitched chirping sound. They turned and ran down the field and the Stegosaurus followed at a slower pace, waving their spiky tails behind them as they kept the same defensive formation as before. Brokenhorn lowered his head and growled at the trees by the stream, slowly backing up as he did. The other one followed suit until they suddenly turned and began to gallop after their herdmates. The dinos stampeded past us and began to grow smaller in the distance. Before I could think about what might have scared them off, another loud snap of a twig just to our left made us all jump. Then another and another. We turned and some of us screamed when out of the bushes ran. Johnny. He had taken the long way around to avoid detection from the angry bull. 
but had also given us a heart attack in the process. Jesus, dude, I yelled. Next time say something first. I thought you were another dino sneaking up on us. Relax, man, it's only me. Johnny had a wide, almost crap-eating grin. I mean, it worked, didn't it? Sure, I might have busted a rib butt. That was incredibly dangerous. Do you have any idea how lucky you are to be alive right now? Shouted a very angry Teddy. Hey, it works, so stop complaining. I mean, that didn't look like normal behavior to me. Why would the lead bull attack you like that if it was just going to run away? It seemed more like something else had spooked them. Hey man, quit trying to steal my glory. I stopped, turning into their argument at this point when I noticed Julia. Her face pale like all the blood had drained from it. Her eyes locked on Johnny. No, not Johnny. I realized with a skip of my heart. She was fixated on something behind him. Ed had noticed too and spoke up. Sis, what's wrong? What are you looking at? The other two looked over now. Julia, said Johnny. Slowly, she raised a shaking arm to point behind where Johnny stood. What is that? Johnny turned in and then we saw it. A very large, feather-covered dinosaur stood down the hill from us. It stood on two legs. Its feathers were white with faint black stripes, almost like a white tiger. Practically every part of it was feathered except the feet, the snot and skin around the eyes. The skinner scales were pitch black, and it had long arms with three-fingered hands, each tipped with deadly-looking claws, but it lacked the toe claw of a raptor. I already knew that it wasn't a raptor, though. It was way too big to be one. It looked to be about seven or eight feet tall and something like 20 to 25 feet long. It just stood there, staring up at us. I suddenly remembered the dinosaur on the IPS banner. The Allosaurus. Could this be it? But just as I quickly realized how different it looked, the Allosaurus was depicted as tan in color, with a red head crest and a scaly body. This animal was definitely something else. Teddy, I stuttered out. What are we dealing with here? It took him a moment to respond. I think that's the Uteranus Hoeli, he stammered, his voice quaking a little. Tyrannosis, you mean like T-Rex? I asked. Yeah, they were distant relatives. I looked back down at the animal. The only thing that looked Tyrannosaurus-ish was the head shape, which was broad. While looking at the head, I noticed its eyes. They were a deep golden color and they regarded us carefully, calculatingly. I could swear it seemed to know that I was looking at it, and it looked right back at me. Its eyes made it look smart, scary smart. You guys, I think we should go, I said in a low tone. Are you sure? It doesn't seem like it's going to attack, asked Ed. Yeah, it's really just looking at us, added Johnny. But I don't like the way that it's looking at us, I wanted to say. I don't know, it might be territorial, Teddy said. Julia finally spoke up. It's weird, why isn't it doing anything? I looked at it again. It stood perfectly still, almost like a statue. And those eyes, those cruel golden eyes, kept watching us relentlessly. It was like a gunslinger, waiting for us to make the first move. Julia said, You guys, I think we should... I heard three footsteps behind us and went to lock. I only turned far enough to watch the clawed hand go right through Julia's chest. She screamed in sudden fear and pain as a shower of blood exploded out of the front of her body. We all screamed at the horrific sight, and my horror only grew tenfold when I looked a little higher. There was another one, this one even bigger than the first with blonde yellow feathers instead of white feathers. It had its left hand embedded in Julia's body. With one motion, it lifted her into the air. Julia! Ed cried out in desperation. I looked around for something, anything to use as a weapon. I had to save her. I, I had to do something. I found two large sticks, and I grabbed both and then shouted to Johnny. I tossed him one stick, and he immediately understood. And we charged forward, 
raising the sticks over her heads and yelling in what I can best describe as our attempt at a battle cry. We brought the sticks down on the beast's flank and kept a smacking it over and over. I felt my hands bleed as I tried to force the monster to release my friend. The hit seemed to actually hurt it as it growled at us and stepped back, still holding Julia. And we rushed forward for another attack, only to be met by a massive tail that sent us hurtling backwards. And I hit a tree so hard the wind was instantly knocked out of me. I looked up and to my terror and dismay, the predator still had a grip on Julia. She was struggling to break free, kicking and punching at the arm of the dinosaur. Her efforts were seemingly in vain though. The claws had a grip on her. I heard another growl and I looked over to see the white dinosaur running up the hill. Then suddenly, another white one appeared around the same size as the first. My god, they were going to rip her apart. I stood back up and rushed forward ready to fight. I knew that I would most likely die, but if it was to save my friends, I was ready for it. Johnny followed me, apparently also ready to sacrifice himself. Ed and Teddy joined in too. It seemed like this was where we would make our last stand. Stop! shouted Julia. We all stopped immediately. What? I shouted. You'll never make it. It's me they want. Run now while you still can. Are you crazy? screamed Johnny. Just go and hurry. I could see the dinosaur's head lowering, its lips parting to reveal large, sharp teeth. Julia, you can't, screamed a desperate Edmund. She stared down at him and for just a moment, despite all the chaos, the whole world seemed to slow down and grow quiet. I could only watch as the two stared into each other's tear-filled eyes, both full of sorrow and fear. But in Julia's eyes, I saw something else, something fierce, determination. I love you. Those were her final words spoken to her younger brother. The Uteranus suddenly clamped its massive jaw around her head. Her whole body went limp instantly, and she was gone. Edmund let out a cry of pure anguish, a soul-wrenching sound that hurt my ears more than the sickening crunch of bones did. He fell to his knees, and me and Johnny had to grab him by his arms and drag him away. He was still screaming Julia's name, telling us to go back, telling us that we could still save her. The poor kid. His mind must have been fried by such a horrifying sight. I know dang well that mine was. We kept dragging him, even as tears streamed down our cheeks and made our visions blurry. Yet I could still see well enough to watch the carnage unfold. The Uteranus pack were now fighting over Julia's remains, tearing at her flesh and bones while snapping, clawing, and growling at each other. The larger yellow one seemed to be the most dominant as it took most of the body from the other two. They ate with alarming speed, and soon all that was left were her tattered clothes hanging from their blood-soaked teeth. The yellow alpha turned towards us, still dragging Ed. It let out a deep, whooping call, almost like a crane, to the other two, and then began running towards us. Oh crap, I exclaimed. Ed, buddy, we need you to get up now. Teddy tried a sweet-talking him, but it wasn't working. The dinosaurs were getting closer. Ed, we really need you to get up. They were practically on top of us. Ed, you gotta... Johnny pushed him out of the way and shouted right in Ed's face. Ed, you gotta move now or so help me God. Ed finally snapped out of his shock and took to his feet and we ran. We ran as fast as we could and as far as we could. We ran as the muscles in our legs burned and our lungs screamed for oxygen. But still, we ran. The dinosaurs weren't far behind. I could hear them whooping and growling at each other as they pursued us. And still, we ran. We ran until we burst out into an open field. There was a fence lining it, a high-voltage one. But we ran towards it anyway, as our only other option was what killed our best friend only minutes ago. Johnny reached my fence first, and to my surprise, simply threw himself onto it. I fully expected him to get shot, but he didn't. I guess the power was off. He climbed to the top and jumped over. Teddy scrambled up next like a squirrel being chased by a dog. It was just me and Ed now. 
We climbed up together, huffing and puffing as the dinosaurs drew nearer. Ed reached the top first and extended a hand to help me. I reached for it, but out of the corner of my eye, I saw one of the Uteranus just below me leaping up with its massive mouth open to grab me. I screamed and flung my hand out. Ed took my hand and pulled me out of harm's way, and just as those gargantuan jaws slammed shut with such force, a few teeth popped out. If my leg had been there, I would have gone home hopping on one foot. We fell over the fence with no grace and hit the ground hard. I rolled over and looked up. The three giant predators stared angrily from the other side of the fence. I got up and slowly backed to the others. The dinosaurs began to pace around the fence, letting loose low growls of frustration. While at least two of them did, the yellow one, the alpha, simply looked around at the fence, and then it pushed its snout against the fence as if it were testing it. Its eyes widened when it realized the fence was safe. Oh no. It suddenly attacked the fence, using its claws and teeth to tear it up. The other two noticed and rushed over. They're coming through, run, I shouted. To where? Teddy questioned. I looked around and we were completely out in the open. Nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. But still we had to at least try. Julia died to give us a fighting chance and I wasn't about to give up so soon. That way, go, I shouted to my team. We ran hard, but the dinosaurs were still gaining. I realized that we were going to get caught at this rate. Up ahead were some big rocks, and as we ran past them, Ed suddenly tripped on one. We stopped and rushed back to help him, but we realized that we were too late. They were closing the gap, and they would be all over us in a matter of seconds, even if we tried to run again. I looked down at the rocks and grabbed the biggest one. Everyone grab a rock, this is it. We all armed ourselves, and I was fully aware the odds weren't in our favor. Like it all, but I wasn't afraid of death at that point. I think none of us were. We just wanted revenge. The lead dinosaur opened its mouth and extended its claws, about to attack me in front. I held my ground and shouted my final words. Come and get it! An earth-shaking roar humbled my ultimatum. They suddenly stopped dead in their tracks, and not looking at us, but looking at something directly behind us. Their eyes widened in apparent fear. I heard it before I saw it. A loud thum, thum, thum of approaching footsteps. Whatever it was, it was big. Even bigger than the Uteranus. Another roar resounded, this time ten times louder than the last. It sounded like a mixture of a crocodilian bellow and a cassowary noise but with so much bass it shook my very core. The sound was right behind us, and when I turned to look, I was met with something both amazing and terrifying. An absolutely giant dinosaur stood only ten feet from us. It was definitely a carnivore, and its mouth was opened in a threatening gesture towards the smaller Uteranus. This helped to reveal the biggest teeth that I had ever seen, each the size of a banana. They were shaped like steak knives, but had serrations like a shark. Its arms were somewhat short, but were tipped with three claws. Its body was scaly with an orange color, mixed with a leopard-like black spotted pattern. The only feathers that it had were on the back of its tall head, and they were more like long quills than feathers. And it was enormous, easily over 10 feet tall and probably over 45 feet long. I thought for a split second this might actually be a T-Rex, but I realized the dang thing was even bigger somehow. Carcurodontosaurus, I heard Teddy whisper. The mammoth carnivore kept its mouth open as it walked right past us and towards the other dinosaurs. They growled at it and held out their arms as a threat, but clearly they had nothing on their much larger rival. It kept walking forward, teeth bared like a giant scaly hippo. And then it took a few great strides forward and roared again. So loudly the birds in the distant trees scattered. This sent the Uteranosaurus into full retreat. They legged it through the gap in the fence and didn't stop running, even after making it into the trees. The Carcuodontrosaurus watched them go with a few snarls and snorts, satisfied with its victory. And then it saw us. 
It looked down at the four scared teenagers lying by its feet and seemingly felt the same about us as it did to the other dinosaurs. We were intruders in its territory. It opened its mouth again with a menacing snarl like a deep-pitched crocodile hiss. It took a step forward. Was this it? Was this how we went out? Just as it took another step forward, a sudden pop and hiss sounded out, and green smoke began to billow around us. The carnivore shook its head and breathed in and out. It seemed like there was a scent in the green smoke it didn't like. Before I could comprehend what was happening, a pair of hands wrapped around my shoulders. I looked up and was shocked to see the young woman that we previously saw outside the aviary. Come on, let's go. She barred to me and began pulling me across the grass. I looked over and saw the other three being dragged away as well. One by the man that she was with before, Elliot, if I remember correctly, and the other two by what looked like security guards in uniform. They were pulling us to a nearby jeep, and just as we had hopped in, I looked back and got one last good look at the behemoth. It was leaving the area repelled by the green smoke. It lifted its head to watch our car roll away. Orange red eyes regarded us with a silent fury, but instead of chasing us, it kept going the other way. I guess it had had enough for one day. The long drive was arduous and we were all out of breath and felt like emotionless husks. After everything we saw, everything we went through, I knew none of us would ever be the same. I heard Ed silently weeping and repeating Julia's name over and over. Teddy and Johnny patted him on the shoulder though I could see tears forming in Johnny's eyes too. Eventually we had arrived at a large facility where we were escorted out of the car and each taken to a separate room. Questioning rooms, and I was with the woman. Okay, kid, I'm gonna ask you some questions, and my friends are gonna do the same with your friends. If you talk, it'll make things go much easier and quicker. Once we're done, I'll talk to my higher-ups and hopefully figure out what I'm gonna do with you all. Okay? Yeah, okay, I stuttered. I really didn't want to do this. I just wanted to go home to forget any of this ever happened. Our following conversation went a little something like this. Well, I'll start. My name is Amanda Wellington. I'm the lead animal behavioralist here and the head of the ranger team. Now, who are you? I told her my name. How did you and your friends get here? I explained the whole story. Our hike, our discovery of the pipes, and our encounter with the Deinonychus. Oh, you saw Hawkeye. That's its name? She's the head female of our troop. A crafty little critter learned how to climb trees to escape her enclosure. She's the one responsible for the troubles that we've been having recently. After she got out, we had a major power issue that shut down fences across the preserve, resulting in many animals roaming outside of their zones. I'm sure you saw that with the Uteranus. They're smart and mean, especially Lioness. She's the mother of the other two, the white males. I stayed silent. I really wish she had shut up because her description was only bringing back the horrific images of Julia's demise. Hey kid, you alright? Amanda asked. No. Is something bothering you? Everything is bothering me. What is this place? How did you bring back dinosaurs? What are you using them for? She paused. Well, I'm legally not allowed to answer those questions. I figured as much, but then she added... But you seem like a nice kid, so I'll say just a little. I leaned in now, eager to hear what she had to say. You probably don't know this, but cloning technology has advanced rapidly in the past 20 years. We're almost on the verge of creating cloned human beings. This place was created to test the limits of this technology. An international coalition formed in secrecy. If the world knew, they probably wouldn't handle it well. You know how people get they spook, they panic, they fearmonger. They make crappy clickbait news articles. Something like this would cause a media explosion of massive proportions and would strain diplomatic tensions. But why dinosaurs? They were the ultimate test for our technology, bringing back species from millions of years ago, with only fragments of proteins left in the bones to constitute DNA. Not only have we brought them back, they're almost perfect replicas of their prehistoric ancestors. None of that Jurassic Park nonsense. 
It also helps this place to be the paleontology capital of the world. Ever noticed how paleontologists constantly change their reports and hypothesis these days? Uh, yeah, I guess. Uh, thank the IPES for that. We're making groundbreaking discoveries every day regarding dinosaur behavior and anatomy. It's a goldmine of scientific information unlike any before. She said something else, but I didn't hear it. My mind had started to wander again back to Julia. Hey kid, you're zoning out on me again, hello? She snapped her fingers in my face. Huh? Oh yeah, sorry, I was just, uh... Just what, kid? I can tell something's really bothering you, and it doesn't have to do with the stuff you asked. She put her hand on mine like a mother helping her kid would. You can tell me anything, I promise. I sighed. There would be no easy way to tell her this. There were five of us at first. A girl named Julia was with us. She's Edmund's older sister. Oh, well, where is she then? She, she was, uh, I sighed again. The pack killed her. That made Amanda's eyes widen with shock. She suddenly excused herself and left the room for a minute. I heard her talking with someone outside. The only words that I can make out was her saying, Get out there and find her. She came back in and said, Oh, don't worry. There's a group of security officers that are going to go find her. What? Did you not just hear me? She's dead. Oh, you might have seen something wrong. I know how the mind can affect you during times of... For Christ's sakes, lady, it bit her head off. I was right there when it happened. A moment of silence. She's gone. My hands went up to cover my face. As the tears came, I heard her phone buzzing. She took it out, spoke with someone on the other end, and her voice suddenly turned low and somber. Really? She asked and then sighed. All right, I'll be out there soon. I'm with one of the other kids right now, and then she hung up. What did I tell you? I said through silent sobs. She's gone. Suddenly, my hands weren't covering my face. I looked up to see her holding them. I'm so terribly sorry about all of this. You kids should have never gone through something so horrible. And I'm very sorry about your friend. She leaned over and hugged me. And though I don't like to admit it, that little display of affection and understanding made all the tears come flooding out in big, ugly sobs. When I eventually calmed down, she spoke up again. I need to get back out there. I'll come back as soon as I can and then we'll decide what to do with you. Hopefully, we can just send you home as long as you never tell anyone. But what if I can't? I asked. She paused and frowned a little, and I didn't like that. Don't worry about that right now, just get some rest. And then she laughed. It's been 15 minutes and she's still not back yet. They don't know I still have my phone and I'm typing this story in the hopes that someone, anybody will see it. Maybe you can get us out of here. Maybe you can call for help. I don't know what they plan on doing with us, but it can't be anything good. We've seen too much. We can't be let out. Surely that can't be the case, right? Maybe I should hold out hope. Maybe these people aren't as bad as I think. So if anybody's reading this, me, Teddy, Johnny, and Edmund are still here. We're still here. Help us. Before we're forgotten.